almost loaded. Is the lighting okay? okay? Yeah, yeah, looks good. Sorry, it's just it's just taking a second to load. Almost there. Okay, and we are live. Hi, web shadowers. Thank you so much for joining our session today. Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Ne I'm just gonna say Dr. C because I don't want to butcher your last name. I'm so sorry. I was like practicing it in my head, but I'm gonna say Dr. C. <laughs> um, and she will be presenting on pulmonary critical care today. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the chat box at the end. With that being said, Dr. C, you can start whenever you're ready. All right, sounds great. Hi guys, thank you all for uh, coming and listening to me talk. Today I'm gonna to be talking about what I do. And um, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to post them in the box as Sophia had said. So to begin, uh, this is a pulmonary critical care shadowing session. And basically when I was in med school, I actually had no idea really what pulmonary critical care was. I knew that there was a study of the lungs like, um, as in everything, gastroenterology, endocrinology, rheumatology, neurology, I've heard of pulmonology, but I never really heard of critical care as a med student. It, be, it dawned on me more as I went through my rotations. And I mean, for you guys now with COVID, I'm sure you've been getting exposed to people talking about the ICU and more about the study of lung pathology is becoming a very big thing these days. But basically what I do, pulmonary critical care, so board certified, I'm, I will be board certified in both. There's different pathways you can go about it, but um, so these two kind of go hand in hand, pulmonary and critical care. So pulmonary, like I said, is a study of lung pathology, whether it be asthma, COPD, interstitial lung disease, pleural effusions, uh, pneumothorax, air in the lungs, XYZ, shortness of breath. That, that's the pulmonary part. Then the critical care part is uh, we basically deal with the critically ill people who are at uh, life-threatening illnesses, you, we take care of patients in the intensive care unit setting, which is different than the normal general medical floors. Sometimes there will be a step-down critical care. Um, there's different types of critical care. So there's a surgical critical care, a neuro critical care for post-strokes, um, for EVDs, extraventricular drain placements after neurosurgeries. Uh, there's a cardiac critical care, um, and that's for like post cabbage after someone has a heart attack and they get cardiac catheterization or a cabbage, uh, or if they're on an LVAD, a left, it's a ventricular assist device or a balloon pump for their heart. Uh, but yeah, the surgical critical care, the surgical ICU is post trauma, post codes, um, ECMO, which is, uh, it's a device, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So it basically bypasses the lungs and there's another one that bypasses the lungs and the heart. So yeah, so it sounds all very cool and kind of scary, but it's really, um, it's really cool. <laughs> it is cool. I love what I do. Uh, so I kind of came about this because, because I always thought I wanted to do hemonc, but then Going into med school, I saw, I, I did a couple of ICU rotations in my third year, no, in my fourth year. I did two, well, I started, first did one and I was like, I love this. In the ICU, you're taking care of every single system from head to toe. So when we present in the ICU, we will start a presentation like 60 year old male came in for shortness of breath, found to have COVID-19 pneumonia, now is intubated. So when you present, um, you kind of present every aspect. So compared to like general medical floors, if I said this patient's here for COVID-19 pneumonia, you take that one specific assessment and you say, okay, COVID-19 pneumonia, this is what we're doing. But for ICU, it's like, all right, you start with neurology because it's head to toe. So you'll say neuro, then you'll say ENT if um, there's something like a sinus infection that they're in the ICU for, respiratory, cardio, GI, endo, musculoskeletal, uh, so yeah, so that's like head to toe and you have to say something for each specific system when you are presenting um, in the ICU. So I thought that was really cool in my fourth year. And I was like, this is what I want to do. 
critical care. But then I heard, um, then I talked around like my friends, family and stuff, and you can just do critical care. So like you, you can do critical care after internal medicine. So you can do internal medicine and just critical care. You can do ER and then just do critical care. You can do surgery and just do critical care. Um, you can do internal medicine and just do critical care. But another pathway you can go is internal medicine and pulmonary critical care, which is what I chose. Uh, you can just do internal medicine and pulmonary, and that would be two years, but mine is three years. So that's a little bit about what I do. If you do have any other questions, just feel free to drop them in. Oh, another reason I really like pulmonary critical care is because in addition to getting the sickest of the sick, being stressed about patients being very ill, you get the, um, the aspect of clinic which is a lot chill, a lot chiller than like the ICU. You're not running around. You're not lining people or intubating people. It's um, you're taking care of awesome pathology. Like today I was just in clinic. I actually came back um, not too long ago, maybe 30 minutes ago. And I saw somebody post COVID-19 pneumonia who, uh, who had COVID back in April, was intubated on the vent, actually had a trach, got decannulated. And I got to see their, his, uh, C this patient's CT scan today. He still has some residual effects, like the ground glass opacities are still in his CAT scan and he's still coughing. But um, other than that, I saw a bunch of people that had asthma, a few that had COPD, one that had aspergilloma, which was really cool. It's like a fungus ball in their lung. So you get to see like really cool stuff. All right, so to begin, uh, we will start going over a case and this will kind of put together um, what I do, my management that I go through uh, we'll start and I tried to break it up where you can see both aspects like a pulmonary aspect and then the critical care aspect so definitely stop me or definitely if you have any questions, you can put them in the box. So we will begin so case one 65 year old male with a past medical history of coronary artery disease heart failure preserved ejection fraction 60 to 65 percent diabetes mellitus, rheumatoid arthritis, comes to the office for evaluation of shortness of breath. He reports shortness of breath has been going on for four years now. He describes it as associated with exertion, however, it can happen at rest as well. He endorses being able to walk one to two blocks before having to stop to catch his breath, and he has difficulty climbing stairs. It's kind of a general history. Uh, you kind of try to get a sense for what's going on. That's, this is one of the most common, common complaints, uh, chief complaints that we get, we as pulmonary in the office, shortness of breath. So to kind of tease out, is this respiratory? Is this pulmonary? I mean, is this pulmonary? Is this heart? Is this musculoskeletal? Is this just deconditioning? Is this neuromuscular disease? It's like, it's not easy to tease out, but um, that is part of our job. So past medical history is as above, uh, just to remind you guys, it's coronary artery disease, uh, heart failure, diabetes, and rheumatoid arthritis. Past surgical history, appendectomy, fempop bypass repair, hip replacement, um, past family history, mother with pancreatic cancer, father with some type of lung disease. That's very important for us for um, past family history and then social history. So tobacco use daily, smoked since he was 20 years old, one pack per day. It's important to know pack year. So if it's one pack per day and 20 years and you get 20 pack year on smoking history, no other illicit and drink and no other illicit drugs. So no cocaine. That's important to know too, because cocaine can cause lung problems along with heroin can give you septic emboli. So a lot of um, bad things can happen with illicit drugs to the lungs, marijuana too, and vaping. We have seen vaping cases and drinks occasionally. So anything else uh, you would like to know with this history and that presentation, just to remind you guys, your shortness of breath, being able to walk one to two blocks before having to stop. So anything specific that um, you would think of asking him, anything else you would like to know? I'll give you like 10, I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer. Great questions. So you guys asked if he's on any current medications 
And that's a great question. Um, sometimes medications can cause shortness of breath. If it's a cancer medication that's associated with like pulmonary fibrosis, like bleomycin, nitrofurantoin for UTI sometimes can cause uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Um, amiodarone can give you pulmonary fibrosis as well. So that's a great question. He is not currently, the only medications that he is on is insulin for his diabetes and he's not on anything for his rheumatoid arthritis. But that's a good question. Is he coughing? He coughs sometimes. He says that he coughs here and there, but nothing significant. The, the cough is not associated with mucus production and it's more of a dry cough that he gets when he smokes. Pain history, no pain, just, just the shortness of breath. Any other respiratory symptoms? Um, no other real respiratory symptoms, just the shortness of breath. When did the symptoms start? He, he can't really quantify when, but he's estimating about four years ago. For years now, he said. So maybe, yeah, just estimating for years. Family history. So this is a family history. Mother with pancreatic cancer and father with some type of lung disease. Has it worsened over time, the shortness of breath? Pretty stable over time. Nothing crazy worsening by any means, but it's just been stable. And now, now he's just getting, he's, it's starting to bug him. Does he have allergies? Now that's a good question too. It's very important to find out if somebody has allergies uh, in association with shortness of breath, could be like asthma or um, could just be even allergies, right? He has no allergies that he knows of. Other questions that would be important that we do ask um, now is uh, that, that we ask in the pulmonary clinic is what do you do for a living? This is a very important question because um, they could be exposed to chemical plants, ship makers, asbestosis. Uh, if, they're a, if they work with birds, then there's chlamydia, sitaki. There's a bunch of different um, diseases that's important to know. Silicosis, uh, berliosis, so maybe coal miners, especially whoever of you guys live in the north, um, that's important too. And then other important question is, does he, do, you have pet, do you have pets? And that kind of goes with, do you have allergies? But um, having pets can sometimes cause, they ha we have like bird lung disease, which I mentioned, chlamydia cytokosis. Cito and then there's also hypersensitivity pneumonitis that can be caused by pets. So um, knowing in the social history, usually we ask smoking history, that's huge. We ask allergy history, that's big. We ask uh, what you do for a living and do you have any pets? And then it's kind of interesting here that his father has some type of lung disease. So just um, keep that in mind. So moving forward, um, so we got a guy here. He has coronary artery disease. He has heart failure. He has diabetes. He has rheumatoid arthritis and he comes in with years of shortness of breath. What's uh, important in his past history is tobacco use daily. So he is an active smoker in a 65 year old male. So it kind of makes you think, all right, well, differential time, uh, I'll just go over this for the sake of time, but COPD, it's a big one in a smoker. We, we think this a lot. Um, asthma, so it's important to get like an allergy history, like you guys said, that's, that's a good thought. Um, GERD, because this can always cause shortness of breath. GERD over time, that acid hitting the back of your throat can definitely give you shortness of breath. Coronary artery disease, it's always important to tease out, is this acute coronary syndrome? heart failure, or is this uh, the lungs, lungs and heart, lungs and heart. Those are always the two biggest things that we uh, have to deal with and um, go between each other, cardio and pulmonary. Uh, pulmonary hypertension, that's always on the differential as well, because pulmonary hypertension is now becoming more recognized and it does cause things like shortness of breath over time. And there's different groups of pulmonary hypertension. Interstitial lung disease, ILD. So this over time can give you shortness of breath as well. And interstitial lung disease is just basically thickening of the, um, the, the pleural membrane, the alveolar pleural membrane or fibrosis, um, some type of interstitial lung disease, just the interstitium of the lung becomes fibrosed or um, something occludes it and that decreases your oxygenation and ventilation. And this can happen in patients that have uh, connective tissue diseases. Rheumatoid arthritis is one of them. So he has a history of rheumatoid arthritis that very well could be on the differential. Lung cancer. Anybody who's of age in their um, 60s, who's a smoker, that's always on our differential. So another actually important questions to ask here, and going back to the slides, 
here would be uh, weight loss. It's really important because um, that can point towards lung cancer, coughing blood. I know you guys had asked uh, any other respiratory symptoms and you guys did ask to see coughing, but sometimes patients, people won't tell you I am coughing blood. Even if you ask them, are you coughing? They'll be like, yeah. And you'll be like, okay, what are you coughing? So yeah, so um, coughing blood, specifically asking that question is important. Um, weight loss, appetite loss, because these point towards B symptoms, constitutional symptoms, night sweats. And then that could kind of lead towards like a lung cancer diagnosis. And then PE, pulmonary embolism, that's always on there. As pulmonary, we, uh, we love our PEs, but uh, it's always on the differential. More than likely, it's not that though, because his symptoms seem to be more chronic rather than acute. And if you're thinking like pulmonary embolism, you're gonna think, you're gonna see a patient like acute shortness of breath started a day ago, not years ago, but it's still on differential. So the workup. Generally, this is the most common workup that we as pulmonary um, do to kind of tease out what's going on. So you have your PFTs, that's like our bread and butter we do in the clinic, pulmonary function tests, uh, then a CT thorax without contrast. So this, this workup is specific to this guy. So pulmonary function test. Uh, so that's part, that's like when you check your lung volume. So you do a spirometry, plus you get lung volumes off this. And then these, um, for those of you who do who ever seen pulmonary function tests done, they're not easy, but um, but they they give you a lot of information about the lung reserve of a person and the lung function of a person. Then a CT thorax, we we like to get imaging of the lungs to kind of see what's going on. And specifically, I put the without contrast low dose CT, LDCT, which we will talk about soon. Then an echocardiogram. And this is important to see, is this heart? Because he already has this, because this patient already has a coronary artery disease with preserved ejection fraction. So maybe his heart failure has gotten worse now. So that's why we're getting an echo. And then plus or minus, you can do an EKG, you can do a troponin, you can get a BNP, brain natriuretic peptide to see um, he's in heart failure. So getting into pulmonary function tests. So like I said, this is the bread and butter of um, pulmonary. So we love our PFTs. So what you, the ratio that you mainly use is FEV1 over FVC. And then you look at, so gold criteria says 70%, but a lot of other criteria does say 80, as 80 would be our cutoff, but a lot of ATS and gold do say 70. So, I mean, in our hospital, we use 80. Um, so what you do here is you would look at the FEV1, FBC, and then you would see if it's normal or greater, because then that would be like, you would, it would point towards more of a restrictive process. And then if it's below uh, 80, then that's an obstruction, an obstructive process. And then uh, if you guys have heard of the gold spirometric criteria for COPD severity, see here, this one says 70% here, and this says 80% here. So, I mean, it really bases what you go off of. This here, like I said, was the gold criteria, and that's what they use, 70% cutoff. But then here, this is 80% because some people use 80% criteria cutoff. This one is the newest, the 80%, the 70% is actually older, but um, I mean, like I said, it depends who you ask and which criteria you go by but you would be tested more on the 70%. So if you're gonna use this to its testing, definitely do it more on the 70%. I'm just taking a look at the chat box really quick. Got a great question between what is the difference between CT with con and without contrast? So that's a, that is a good question. And everybody always asks this. So CT with contrast is when you actually take contrast and inject it through the dye. And as you're getting the CT scan, so a CT scan is you're going into a tunnel like thing and your body's moving it. So it's taking cut images. It's a CT imaging slicing. So you're taking each cut. And as you're going through the cuts, if you have contrast, then you're seeing the contrast move through. So you, you inject it and it goes into your veins. It'll go like your superior vena cava, then it'll go into your, your right atrium, your right ventricle, and then through your pulmonary artery. Now, this is the important part. It'll go through your pulmonary vein and then you through your pulmonary artery. And the point of this and then it will disperse into lungs. The point of this is to see if um, if you have a pulmonary embolism. So that's when we get 
CTs with contrast for pulmonary embolism. Other times we would get um, CT with contrast would be for lymphadenopathy. If we're suspecting somebody has uh, cancer to see lymph nodes, contrast helps. Otherwise, if you're just gonna look at the lung, the lung parenchyma, you do not need contrast. Contrast causes AKI, acute kidney injury, as we, um, as we all know. So we prefer to do them without contrast. So a low-dose CT is non-contrast and um, in a low-dose CT, you're not exposed to as much radiation as you are a normal CAT scan. So we do low-dose CAT scans for patients with COPD um, and patients who are active smokers. And we'll go into the lung cancer criteria screening, but that, that's part of it, the low dose CT, what we do for lung cancer screening. So going back to the gold spirometric uh, criteria for COPD severity, first you go through the ratio, and then if you're going to use a ratio of 70%, because that's more than likely what you will be tested on. So then you already know this patient has obstruction if, if the ratio is below 70%, as you can see here. Then you would look to see the FEV1. The FEV1 will tell you the severity. So the ratio will just tell you if it is it obstruction, is it restriction? And then you go to FEV1 that will tell you the severity. So if it's 50 to 80, we call this moderate. And then, um, and then this does, okay, yeah. So if it's 50 to 80 and then less than third, 30 to 50 would be severe. And this would be like FEV1 of 31. You would see it on the, on the pulmonary function test. It would be noted to you. So you'll be like, okay, FEV1 is, I don't know, 30. So then you'll be like, okay, this is severe COPD. And also uh, you try to see the symptoms. So you kind of go symptom based along with the numbers. And then this would tell you if it's mild, uh, moderate, severe, or very severe. And this would also give you the gold. So like when I'm seeing a patient with COPD, I would be like, okay, patient is gold to COPD. And this determines, this helps determine treatment per se. And also the FEV1 uh, and FVC ratio is very important for us as pulmonary when we do our pre-ops. So if we have somebody come to us who has a low FEV1 or somebody or FVC or the ratio, and they, they're trying to go for surgery, like a major surgery, a cabbage or um, abdominal surgery, neurosurgery, something that's going to put them on the vent, bariatric surgery uh, that they have to be intubated for, even sometimes like an EGD a simple or a colonoscopy, something simple like that. They're going to be intubated. So, so um, physicians will send their patients to us for pulmonary clearance. What we look at is we look at the spirometric criteria. So we look to see how good their lung reserve is. And if their lung reserve is good enough to withstand getting intubated and getting extubated. If, and usually if they're, if they're in very severe COPD, we will not, um, we won't clear them. We won't clear them for surgery because that just means that their lung reserve is so low that if you have to intubate this person for surgery, they will not come off the vent, which means that they will live on the ventilator and then eventually have to get a trach. So we won't clear them for surgery. They'll have a lot of post-op complications. And then at that point, it will be up to the patient and the surgeon if they want to proceed or not. But um, it, yeah, so that's part of the pulmonary function test, what we do do. Um, Ooh, okay. And this is kind of like reading. Uh, it's kind of like an algorithm for what you do when you see something on um, spirometry. So we're, they're using the 70% cutoff, which is what you guys should remember in your heads. So here's the ratio. Uh, like we said before, if it's less than 70%, then you're going to look at the FVC because it's, it's like it's less and it's not... Um, and that FEV1 over FVC ratio. Oh, sorry, I'm mixing it up. So if we'll start here. If this is greater than 70%, then that's normal or high. So then you look at your FVC. FVC actually will tell you if it's if you have restriction. So you when we looked at the FEV1, that was more for COPD, like an obstructive pattern. But here we're gonna look at the FVC if we're thinking more restriction. TLC as well. TLC is total lung capacity. So this is something that you look at to see if you're thinking that they're a restriction, that they have a restrictive pattern. Things like pulmonary fibrosis, like we said, can do this. Um, neuromuscular chest wall diseases and pleural disorders can do this too, a restrictive pattern. So you go here first, you look at the ratio, that, that'll be like your first thing that you look at when you do get um, pulmonary function tests, spirometry, you look at the ratio. And if it's normal or higher, then you go to the FVC. 
FEV1 would be if it's lower because then there will be more of obstructive. It would be an obstructive pattern. Here we're thinking that that here we're, we got these for some reason and then they're normal or high. So then we go to the FVC. And then if that's slow, then we can look at the total lung capacity. If you, if you think about it, if somebody has restrictive pattern, whether it be because they have a big body habitus, their chest wall is pushing in, uh, they have neuromuscular disease, um, or they have like pulmonary fibrosis, then their lung capacity won't be as high. So it will be low actually. So, and that would be because there's just, their lungs can't expand whether it, like we said, because of the, you know, fibrosis or something's preventing it from expanding. So your total lung capacity will be low, not high. Sometimes there's non-specific patterns. It could be low, it could be high, normal or high. And you can see this in reactive airway disease and sometimes even effort. A lot of these tests are effort dependent. It's very hard for somebody to blow in, blow out, blow in, blow out. If you've ever had your PFTs done. Uh, then, then there's normal or high pattern with a low DLCO. So this is when you would look at the DLCO. And then there's, um, this can be because of a thromboembolic disease or like a pulmonary embolism. That's thromboembolic disease that can cause a low DLCO because it blocks off the circulation. And when it blocks off the blood flow, then that can affect your DLCO. Pulmonary hypertension can also give you a low DLCO and uh, combined fibrosis and emphysema. So now going here to the, if your ratio is lower because that was if it was normal or high, you go here to see your ratio. Here they're using FVC, they're not using the FEV1, but um, it, the FEV1 will tell you the severity of COPD. So that's part of the gold criteria that you need for severity of COPD. But this algorithm here is saying if your FVC is low and your ratio is low, then you look at your TLC. And if your TLC is high, then this points more to an obstructive pattern. And this is because if you have COPD, you're gonna have air trapping. If you have an obstructive process, you can't get air out. If you think about it, um, what is COPD? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So they have problem exhaling their air. So if you have a problem exhaling your air, the air will be trapped. You'll have air trapping is what we call it. And then that's why your total lung capacity will be high compared to somebody who has restrictive, who can't expand. Um, these COPD ears are hyper expanded. So if you've ever seen a chest X-ray and you see um, the lungs are kind of out like that. It's hyper expanded lungs. Their diaphragm is low. Their lungs are expanded. Uh, yeah, so that goes with the obstructive pattern and why they have higher total lung capacity. I think there were a couple questions. Uh, is this step also required for emergency surgery? Do you refer to the chart frequently? It stuck with you. It stuck with me. This, this chart has definitely stuck with me um, because I, I just read so many. So to me, this is uh, second nature. So for PFTs, emergency surgery, no, it's not required for emergency surgery because if it's like an emergency, uh, someone came for MVA collision and you already know that they're a COPD patient on two liters oxygen, you're not going to get pulmonary clearance before. Sometimes they will clear, they'll call us and then they'll say, hey, can you look at this? Can you look at the um, PFTs that this patient just had done? They're on two liters oxygen. Do you think they'll be okay? And I mean, at that point, we don't really have anything to say. So are, they're already taking them. So I'm kind of like, okay. Even when you use this flow chart, do the spirometry charts still sometimes lead to incorrect diagnosis? That's a good question. Sometimes, I mean, not everything is 100% and a lot of this is effort dependent. So sometimes this chart can lead to incorrect diagnosis. Yeah, if, it's, if somebody does well or does bad on one day, like let's say, someone is sick and tries to go get their pulmonary function test done, we don't recommend that. If somebody just came out of the hospital for um, a COPD exacerbation or they're in an asthma exacerbation actively, we are they're feeling bad, we're like, okay, don't do your pulmonary function test now because it will be inaccurate. Someone has heart failure and they, their, fluid, their um, lungs are full of fluid because of the backflow from the heart, then we're like, okay, don't do your pulmonary function test now. Okay. So this was our guy. Um, yeah, okay. Actually, this was our guy, guys. So this was our guy. Sorry, I put the wrong one up. But so our guy that we, we remember we had him go to get a pulmonary function test done because he was feeling really short of breath. He's a smoker. So we wanted to see what's going on with his lungs. All right, so um, just kind of reading these. If you can see here, there's only spirometry. You don't see a TLC, 
total lung capacity and you don't see a residual volume. Sometimes some patients just can't do the next steps of the um, pulmonary function test. They can only do the spirometry part because their lung, their lung reserve is just so bad that they can't inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. It's just too much for them. So we do what we can get. So this was our guy, our 65 year old male with diabetes, heart failure, preserved ejection fraction, coronary artery disease, smoker who came in for uh, shortness of breath. All right, so here, here is what you look at. There's a spirometry, here's the ratio. You take this percent, you use the percent predict that this is what you'll be focused, this is what you'll be looking at. And if you see here, he's at 33%. That's really bad. Poor, poor lungs. Then, because you already know it now, you know that it's below the 70, so he's very obstructed, 33%. So then you go to FEV1 to see his severity, and it's 17. That's very, very low. And then you look at the FVC as well, which is 50 and that's low too. So there's, if you see here, there's a pre-bronch and then there's post-bronch. What that means is bronchodilator. So we give two puffs of albuterol um, after you take these numbers. So you do one whole set, you, get, you tell them to blow in, blow out, blow in, blow out. And then uh, you give them albuterol and then you tell them to do it again. And then here, these numbers are what you see post. So for example, with his, with this guy's ratio, it was 33. And then we gave him the post bronchodilator. It's still 33. He had a zero plus change. With his FV1, he went from 17 to 18, but he had plus eight change um, in terms of his, this number, the 0.49 became 0.53. And then here it's, uh, it went from 50 to 55. He had a plus 8% change again. What, what this is important to tell you is if the patient has asthma. So the criteria, for, does anybody here know the criteria for asthma based off um, pulmonary function tests? You can answer in the group, in the chat, if you, if you know the answer to what criteria you need to diagnose asthma from pulmonary function test. I think for the sake of time, I'm just gonna answer. So 200 cc's, you need um, 200 cc's from this actual to he from here to here. 200 cc's and 12% uh, change. And this basically means that when um, that, all right, so basically what, what force vital capacity is, is the volume of air that's blown out after full inspiration. So you take in a, you take in a normal breath, you inspire, and then uh, how much air you can blow out. Okay, if you have COPD or if you have asthma, your airways are gonna collapse on themselves. That's more for COPD. If you have COPD, your airways are gonna collapse on itself. When they collapse on themselves, then the air gets trapped. They can't exhale. They can't forcibly push out air. And that's the force vital capacity is the FVC. So when you give someone albuterol, an asthmatic, they, it opens up their airway, so they should be able to blow out more. So you expect to change, expect it to go higher in the FVC and in the FEV1, because what is the FEV1? It, that's force, that's uh, force expiratory volume in one second. So that's, um, that's something that we look at as well. And that's really, that's important because like we said, COPD and asthma are obstructive processes, obstructive airway processes. They can't blow air out. So um, somebody asked a great question, what causes them, what causes these people to not blow in and blow out? What issue causes them to not continuously inhale and exhale? So they can't continuously inhale and exhale because their, their airway disease is just so bad. In COPD, like we said, the airways just collapse on themselves and in asthma, they have bronchospasm, so the airways just close. So they just, they just can't do it. Every time they blow in, their airways will collapse, so they can't blow out. 
Um, and same with asthma. Every time they blow in, they'll get a bronchospasm. And if they get a bronchospasm, then they just can't do it. Okay. Okay, so this is an example of a full pulmonary function test. So as you he see here, once again, you look at the spirometry part. Here is the ratio. And then you go towards the percent, which is 45 and 45 again. So there's not much on the post bronchodilator change, but here you can see it's 45 and 45%. So once again, this is 45, so that's less than 70%. So the subtraction, then you go to FEV1, and then you look and you see that that's uh, 53. So that's that will fall in the severe category. So this patient has severe obstruction. You can look to see if, and then this is 90. And you can look to see if there's a bronchodilator change response. And like we said, that's 200 cc's and that'll be 1.31. If there was positive 200, it should go from 1.31 to 1.51, but it does not. And then here too, it does not go um, plus 200 cc's. And then the percent change should also be 12%. And the reason we said this for forced vital capacity or forced expiratory volume in one second, FEV1 is forced expiratory volume in one second. And forced vital capacity is the volume of air that's forcibly blown out after inspiration. These numbers increase by 200% or 12% because you're opening up the airway after giving albuterol. Albuterol is a beta 2 agonist and that causes the airways to open. So once the airways are open, you can get out more air. And that's why you expect to change if you have asthma or reversible airway disease. So this ratio here is 45%. FEV1 here is 53%. So severe obstructive, um, severe obstructive airway disease. There's a lot of other numbers here, like the FEF, 25 to 75%. That's just small airways. So it's forced, this basically forced expiratory flow at 25% of your exhalation, then 50% of your exhalation, then 75% of your exhalation. We don't really use that. That one's a little more um, advanced. This is total lung capacity. As you can see here, this total lung capacity is 117. So that goes with what we were talking about, an obstructive process. An obstructive process, you can't get the air out. So then they have so much air in their lungs. So that's why their total lung capacity is higher. And their residual volume, 144. So this, this is, so residual volume is the amount of air that's left in your lungs after exhalation. So it's kind of the end of the, um, the curve here. This is the end of the curve after you have exhaled. And that's the volume of air that's left in your lungs. So the residual volume kind of tells you uh, if this patient has air trapping or if there's a lot of air that's left in, in this person's lungs. And here, this patient has a lot of air in their lungs still, 144. So that's high. And then you'll get your DLCO. Here is 9.2. That's, that's really bad. 9.2 and 52 percent. So this is our, um, this is the flow chart, which basically is how the um, numbers for our PFTs do come about. That um, for the numbers do come about. So this is your inspiratory reserve volume. And that's just basically how much uh, air that you can, that you do pull in your inspiratory reserve. Um, and most of these people are obstructive patients. They don't have problems, COPD and asthma, they don't have problems, anything Nothing's wrong with their inspiratory process. It's all expiratory because it's a chronic obstructive. But sometimes some patients can have problems in, um, taking in a deep breath and their inspiratory reserve volume if they have like tracheal stenosis or they just got intubated or they have swelling in their throat. Um, they have a big goiter, vocal cord uh, paralysis, vocal cord stenosis, which we can see on PFTs as well. This is vital capacity. This is just a normal tidal breath. So you normally inhale and you normally exhale. So that, that's the vital capacity part. This is your tidal, your tidal volume. And uh, your tidal volume is just your normal six to, six, six to eight cc's per kg. This is your normal tidal volume that um, is expected. And then uh, your expiratory reserve volume. And this, is, this can be higher in patients with uh, obstructive airway process, the expiratory reserve volume, just because their lungs are so hyperinflated. And then your functional residual capacity. And the functional residual capacity, this is normally decreased when uh, somebody's obese or somebody has ascites or something that's pushing on the diaphragm. And this, this is kind of the air after a normal tidal breath that's left. Because this is a normal tidal breath here, the tidal volume. GFRC is your ERV plus your residual volume. 
it's kind of confusing, but your FRC is um, what's left after a normal tidal volume breath, like if you're just breathing in now. But then the ER, the residual volume part is after a forceful. So you try to just blow out everything you can. You just blow out everything you can. Whatever is left is your residual volume. So your FRC is your ERV plus your residual volume. Okay, so this was our guys, uh, PFTs, if you remember. So basically, at this point, we have a 65-year-old male who is a smoker, and we see here that his pulmonary function tests have very low um, ratio, under 70, and FEV1 is 17%. So at this point, we can give him the diagnosis confidently of, of COPD. Plus, he doesn't have the bronchodilator change that would make us think maybe this is asthma and COPD, or maybe this is a reactive airway disease. This is another example of PFTs, kind of to just show you guys um, something here. So this ratio here that you look at is 75. So it's normal, it's not our normal like 30s that we were seeing or 50s. So we're like, okay. So we go to the FBC and it's 1.52. We also look at the FV1, it's a 55 here and then it's 52 here with the normal ratio. So if you see both these numbers, the FEV1 and the FVC decrease, but the ratio normal, then you think of um, then you think of more restriction. And then you go to the total lung capacity. And here at the total lung capacity at the lung volumes, you see it's 62 and 62 is low. So then you're like, all right, well, this guy has restriction or this patient has restriction. So this is an example of a restrictive pattern. The ratio is normal, then the numbers are low, but both are low. And then the TLC is low as well. Residual volume is normal, 70, it's not 100. Your DLCO is low. These are flow volume loops. Uh, I mean, this is this is a little more complicated, but a normal flow volume loop here is the black. And basically, like we were saying earlier, flow is how much you're exhaling. A flow is the amount of volume that you're exhaling uh, with, and then this tells you how much that you are. Oh, I got a, good, I got a question here. How long does it take, typically take you to diagnose a patient like this? That's a good question. I mean, we diagnose COPD very, very frequently. If we have the clinical history, and we have pulmonary function tests almost immediately because the PFTs tell you what the diagnosis essentially. Plus these, um, these flow volume loops as well help with the pulmonary function test. And then what uh, the last thing to help would be imaging. So imaging is kind of a dead giveaway if it's like straightforward emphysema or, um, or you can see a COPD type pattern on it, then that would give you the diagnosis. So here, these are flow volume loops. So flow is how much, you're just testing how much uh, air is, how, how much liters per second is coming out when you're just say, when you're taking in a breath and, you're, and when you're taking out a breath. So this here on the bottom is the inspiratory loop. It's, it's a little weird because the inspiration is on the bottom part and the expiration is on the top part. So this, this is a flow volume flow volume loop. And then you have two limbs, inspiratory and expiratory. And the black is normal. And then if you see here, we'll start with the obstructive. So obstructive lung disease is the green one. And then we said that they have a problem with exhaling. So look at the black compared to the green. The green here, this person, this uh, an obstructive person when they're blowing out can only take out 300 cc's. But a normal person, or they, they have so much left in their lungs that this is how much they're, that they're able to only blow. And then a uh, normal person goes all the way up here to their peak expiratory flow very high because they can, a normal person can reach their peak expiratory flow when you tell them to blow out quicker. And the reason we use 70% 70, 70 or 80% as a cutoff is because a normal person can exhale 70 to 80% of their normal breath in one second. And that's what this is. So uh, here to generate this, we say, okay, we, we time them and we're like, all right, Take in a deep breath, take out a deep breath, take out a deep breath. And then that's when you get this curve here. So one second, you tell them to take out a deep breath and then um, you see how high they can go. And that's their peak expiratory flow, the highest amount that they can take out in one second. And then here, this is the volume in liters. 
as they're able to, um, to generate their, their flow. And then here are the difference. Oh. Here are the difference for um, a normal person and then an obstructive pattern is do you see that the way that they're decreasing, it's more of a what we call coving. So it's not very, it's not very like a hill, it's more of a cove, like a dome shaped cove. And that's what's happening here with the green. It's more of um, coving and that's because they're able to, they're trying to push out all the air they can, but then it's harder for them to over time. And with restriction, restriction looks very much like um, a normal pattern, but it's, they're just more to the right. If you just, if you just remember that. And the reason is because their lung capacity is decreased. So they're having things that are pushing on their, um, their lungs to when they're trying to exhale their breath. And then there's fixed air, upper airway obstruction. So this is if somebody has tracheal stenosis or, um, bronch or um, tracheal bronchitis, or um, they just got intubated and extubated. They have swelling in their, in their throat. And then this is that pattern. And this is again, talking about um, the differences here. You can see it just takes a long time for somebody with obstructive airway process to blow out all that air. It takes a long time. And here's the restriction. All restricted, there's smaller lung capacity. So it's very much like normal, but just smaller lung capacity. Small airway disease is a little more complicated, but it's similar to um, asthma, small airway disease. Then there's a fixed upper airway obstruction like we were talking about. So this is the, uh, the low-dose CT that we were talking about earlier for patients that do have a smoking history. We now do low-dose CAT scans on these people. And this is our criteria. So you have to be, they have to be between the age of 55 to 80 years old. They have to have smoked now or quit within the past 15 years, heavy smoking history. And that's defined as 30 pack years or more. And um, like he's an active smoker of that patient that we had, right? So we would definitely do this on him. That's why we end up getting specifically low dose CT. But um, low dose CT scans came out maybe in 2015 five, six years ago that showed benefits of screening patients uh, who are smokers because a lot of lung nodules were found and a lot of lung cancers were detected earlier on. Um, so that's, that's why this kind of came about. All right, so this was our patient who went to get his CAT scan. So as you can see here, there's these weird circle things that have just like a lot of black in them with not a lot of uh, air bronchograms as we call it, or lung markings. And this indicates bullet. This is what we call bullet. And bullet is, um, is just entrapped air into these air sacs due to the lung, uh, lung anatomy. You have your airways and then you have your lobules and then you have your smaller air sacs. And when air gets trapped into those air sacs, um, over time, it just becomes bigger and it becomes black because that's, that indicates air. And there's not much lung markings like you see here. So this is an example of emphysema with bullet in the bilateral lower lobes is what we would call it. Because you see on the right and you see on the left. So here too, these are the, these are a huge bullet. Because so this is all like, this is normal lung here, not not that part, that part here is another uh, emphysema bullet here, smaller bullet here. And then here are huge, big confluent bullet. And this, this is important to know when somebody has a um, bullet because if this patient, this person were ever to get intubated, all the positive pressure can in theory rupture a bullet and give this patient uh, a pneumothorax or air in their lungs. So we try we try to avoid that and we try to be cautious of that when we do have to intubate somebody who does have bullet and what vent settings we're gonna put them on and stuff. So this was our patient, this CAT scan here. So now we have a patient who came in with shortness of breath. He had obstruction on his, 
on his PFTs, he had an FEV1 that was severe, severely low. He had, uh, now he has this CAT scan of bulle and emphysema, a bullous emphysema, and he is a smoker. So all that together fits with the diagnosis of COPD. So for this guy, we would say gold, CO, gold COPD, and then we would begin treatment. So COPD, this is a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like we were speaking about. Uh, it's a condition. How do you, how long? Oh, sorry, we got a couple questions. Do you think masks have an effect on breathing if it gets better or worse for people? And what are the effects of COVID on breathing after patients are healthy again? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's actually a question we'll talk about uh, later in the end. How do you express, expect pack, how do you express pack years when someone quit smoking, for example, 16 years ago? You just take how many pack years they were smoking for. So even if they smoked, um, if they quit 16 years ago, like let's say our guy was 20 pack years smoking, but quit 16 years ago, you, you just say that. You don't count his not smoking years with the smoking years. Is vaping just as dangerous as smoking for the long? Yeah, vaping is just as dangerous. And sometimes um, even more dangerous depending on what type of chemicals they put into the vape. Okay. So going into, and for the COVID questions and the mask questions, we'll talk about it at the end. Okay, so going into COPD, this is a common, this is, um, this part is bread and butter of pulmonary. It's like we mentioned multiple times, it's a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease characterized by airflow limitation on exhalation. There's different subtypes. You have emphysema, like we saw in that guy, he had the big bullae and that defines the emphysema and then chronic bronchitis. Um, bronchi so the chronic bronchitis subtype is more of a chronic productive cough. And that in the chronic productive cough has to be has to be for three months consecutive for two years. Um, and that would be that would kind of give you the chronic bronchitis. You have a patient who comes in and they're like, I keep coughing. I have a lot of mucus. I feel short of breath. I'm a smoker. That points more towards a chronic bronchitis cough. And then you have um, obstructive air uh, asthma. So over time, asthmatics can become COPD, or they won't become COPD, sorry, but they can become obstructive. So asthma over time, if it becomes severe and not treated well, then over time, the um, bronchospasms of asthma will just become so bad that it would become obstruction, obstructive process. So COPD can be caused by many things. Uh, smoking is pretty much number one actually can't be caused by many things. It's mainly smoking is the number one cause. Um, sometimes pollution can do it back in the olden days, um, whatever was around in the air and alpha one antitrypsin. So it was actually very, very um, important. And I kind of tried to point it out to you guys that that patient, his father died of some lung disease. So it, it's heritable, her, uh, heritable, and it can be passed down through the X chromosome. So alpha-1 antitrypsin, the father had it, then um, he, then this patient probably could have had it. So we do test now. As part of gold criteria, we test anybody with COPD for alpha-1 antitrypsin. Also, the difference between COPD and asthma uh, is, very, is very important as well. So asthma is reversible airway disease, reversible. That's the key, that's the key note. With COPD, it's, non, it's irreversible. It's airways collapsing on itself that's irreversible. Asthma is bronchospasm. So they're bronchospastic. Their airways will open and close with albuterol, with uh, beta-2 agonists, with steroids. The inflammation will decrease and stop the, and stop the, um, the bronchospasms. And also their, um, their pathophysiology between the two is different as well. For COPD, it's, ab it's uh, abnormalities in the airways and that causes um, the, the mucus cells, the mucoid cells, the goblet cells to overproduce this, um, their excess mucus that they produce. And that can, that can kind of clog, that can kind of um, become hypertrophied within itself and cause the airways itself to collapse on them and cause uh, tethering of the airways kind of collapsing on itself. It can cause destruction of the alveoli, which is what happens in emphysema. Because as you see here, uh, this is not normal airway. These airways are there's no, no there's no normal lung markings. All the small asini just dis, just got destroyed over time, over time, over time, and it became a big um, giant air trapping bullus. 
and this is because of emphysema. Uh, emphysema and more specifically, the chronic inflammation over time and the cells that invade. And the more specific cells for, emphysema, for COPD compared to asthma are different too. So for COPD, you would see more CD8 T lymphocytes and neutrophils. So CD8 T lymphocytes and neutrophils are seen more in COPD compared to asthma. We have more CD4 uh, T lymphocytes, eosinophils, IL-4, IL-5. Um, these increased production of these are seen more uh, in asthma. And now what we're trying to do for treatment is trying to target these. And that's what we'll get into now with treatment. So this is when this is COPD treatment. We were talking about the gold criteria and the gold classification. Uh, so with group A, you just give a bronchodilator. And usually with COPD, we'll start out with a SAMA, so a short acting muscarinic agonist. But some people just get albuterol and they like it, so they keep it. And we're like, okay, well, as long as that stops your symptoms, that's fine. And your MMRC is um, zero to one. Uh, and the MMRC is based off your um, your score of your symptoms, like how far you can walk. Can you walk two blocks, three blocks without getting short of breath and having to stop? Then there's the CAT score, which is COPD assessment um, test. And then they ask you questions based off your daily symptoms and how you're doing. They're subjective uh, markers. Then group B, we would add a LAMA plus a LABA. So instead of doing a short acting for the group A, we would go into a longer acting and we do either just one, or we'll, if they continue to have persistent symptoms, then we'll do both. This could be something like Spireva, Brio, Incruz. Uh, then with group C, we would add on a ICS, um, like Symbacort, um, in addition to their Lama Laba. And then group D, they would be on triple therapy. So triple therapy would be a Lama Laba and an ICS. So long-acting muscarinic antagonist, and then a long-acting beta agonist, and then an inhaled corticosteroid. And this would be for group D. And in addition, if they continue to have exacerbations, then we can use roflumilast, which is a PDE4 inhibitor. Uh, and then we can also do azithromycin, chronic azithromycin therapy. That's been found now. It came out in a New England Journal of Medicine, a big study in 2015, I believe. And it showed uh, benefits of 250 milligrams of azithromycin every, every other or three times a week, so like Monday, Wednesday, Friday or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday for, um, for COPD. And it decreases the inflammation is a thought with that. So yeah, so talking about um, asthma, like we said, this is more CD4, T lymphocytes, eosinophils, um, histamine release, IL-4 and IL-5. This is an uh, inflammatory disease of the airways. It's like we said, it's bronchospasms, just airway kind of collapsing on itself and then giving you wheezing, the wheezing, but you do see wheezing in COPD too. But um, this gives you the rever um, the bronchospasms. And like we said, asthma is reversible. And that's the key point here. And it's important to remember that it's reversible. So it's important to treat these people. Many people in the US do suffer from asthma. This is a big thing that we do see. We have a whole clinic just for asthma. And asthma is believed to be secondary environmental factors, genetics, triggers, and environments. And so with asthma, we kind of tell our patients, we're like, okay, if you notice that you get more short of breath after seeing your dog or cat, then um, you should, if that's actually a common one that we do get, if they, if they have a pet and then they become asthmatic or they become symptomatic to their pet, we start them on um, allergy shots. So we try to desensitize them to the, the trigger if they cannot get rid of the trigger at all. Uh, there's allergy shots that they can get monthly and these shots will um, kind of give them a piece of the of the antigen over and over and just kind of expose their body. But it's done in a completely controlled environment and um, there's steroids by their side in case they need and there's an EpiPen by their side in case they need. But yeah, so it's important to remember that asthma is reversible and that it can be treated. Nowadays, there are a lot more treatments for asthma. Uh, there's a lot of injectables now. We do Nucala, Zolaire, uh, Dupalumab, Mepiluzumab, and these are like um, IL-4 antagonists, IL-5 antagonists, IgE antagonists. Uh, so when you classify, when we're classifying asthma, we'll say like inter mild intermittent or a mild persistent or persistent, moderate persistent or severe persistent. And these are classified by daytime symptoms, nighttime symptoms. And you can also use your peak flow when you're exhaling. So peak flow is what's important for that we um, have. It's like a little device that we give 
asthmatic patients and they what they do is they put it to their mouth and they blow out they exhale peak expiratory flow it, that's what's measuring and the point is like we said it's an obstructive process so on a good day let's say they're able to exhale 400 cc's but then they notice that they're getting more short of breath and they try to exhale and it's at 200 cc's then they know that oh I can't exhale as much. I'm starting to get bronchospastic or my airways are closing. Let me take a Medrol pack or let me use my albuterol. So that they'll call their, they'll call us their pulmonary and then um, we'll say, okay, are you having, um, are, when do these symptoms start? What have you tried? And sometimes we'll just prescribe them a Medrol pack, like a steroid pack over the phone, or we'll have them come and see us. Or if it's really bad and we hear them and they're like on the phone, like panting, then we're like, okay, you need to go to the hospital. So that's what we call peak flow. And it's a great little device um, to have. It's not incentive spirometer. It's a white device and it has um, green, red, and yellow. We try to keep our patients in the green area. So it's like when you blow and then there's certain um, volumes that will give you green, some will give you yellow and some will give you red. And this also helps us to form an asthma action plan for our patients. So this is treatments for, um, for asthma. Step one, it's called step up therapy. Step one is usually just a SABA, PRN, and SABA is a short-acting bronchodilator. Um, so we usually use uh, short-acting beta-2 agonist bronchodilator. So we usually use albuterol. That would be step up. Um, that would be step one. And then if they're still having symptoms, like they come in, okay, doctor, I'm still waking up every night or I'm waking up three times a week and I'm still, I don't feel like my asthma is controlled, then we'll step up the therapy and add a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid to like Simbacorp. Uh, then step three, it would be a, and this here was a short acting beta two agonist. So here it will be a long acting beta two agonist with the in, with the inhaled corticosteroid, or you can just use a medium dose because there are uh, low, medium, and then high doses. So that's also important to remember. And then here at step five, we would start considering omalizumab, which is an anti IgE. Um, antagonists for patients who have allergies. And there's also a, a lot of new ones now for, um, for, uh, for asthma in terms of just treatments. Uh, other things that we can do, uh, if, you're, if anybody's COPD gold D now, there have been a lot of new like therapies in terms in general, just for like for COPD and for um, asthma. So here, this is the bullous emphysema type subgroup of COPD we're talking about. There have been surgeries now for these types of patients that we can do. If the bullous disease takes up greater than 30% of the hemithorax, we could do a lung volume reduction surgery or a bullectomy if it's just one bullet. And basically um, cardiothoracic surgery will just cut out that lung, that portion of the lung, if it's like a lobe, and then you just live with the rest of your, your lungs. So that's like a bullectomy or um, or uh, lung volume reduction surgery. So that's that's one of the things that you can do. Other things that you can do for um, emphysema is place a valve, a valve, which is really cool. So you put a valve into these bullae and because we said that this is an obstructive process and they have trouble blowing out. So these valves, when they're exhaling, it won't do anything when they're inhaling, it's normal. But then when they're exhaling, the valves will open. It's a one-way valve. So it will, it will open out and then it will help exhale that air. So all that air that's trapped will expel. So that's what we call Zephyr valves. There's, the, there's different types of valves now, but that's becoming more common. So I like to refer my patients, um, if they're having a lot of shortness of breath and they have a lot of bullous disease, they could do a, a bullectomy to just remove it. They can do lung volume reduction surgery to remove that part of the lung. They can do the valves. So it's pretty cool that there's surgery like that. Other things we can do if they're gold D um, transplant, we can do lung transplant by, by lung transplant. So two lung surgery, we can do that. Uh, so that's something now that we are referring our patients for lung, lung transplant. Only thing with lung transplant is you have to be under 65. You have to have good family support. And PFTs, your reserve cannot be so low that if we were to intubate you for the procedure, you get you don't you don't get off the vent because in that point, what like your your lung reserve is just so bad. Um, pulmonary rehab, pulmonary rehab is huge. Now this has been shown in studies to reduce um, symptoms. So lung so um, pulmonary rehab is something that we refer almost all of our patients to, as long as they're able to. Um, oxygen. So there was the long the LOT trial uh, that showed a big benefit. It was LTOT. 
It's long-term oxygen therapy for COPD patients. And this showed if, um, if patients go for like a six minute walk test and they decrease their oxygen saturation to under 88%, and also not only six minute walk, but also two minutes. Um, and they check they check their saturations and their heart rate. And if their heart rate shoots up and their oxygen saturations drops below eighty below eighty eight percent, then they're referred for um, for oxygen. So oxygen does help patients. And then sm stopping smoking and vaccinations are very 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 important. Stopping smoking can save can save life and can stop from um, can stop from lung cancer. Okay, so that was asthma on this. All right, so just uh, quickly, another thing that we do that we do talk about is that we see a lot as pulmonologists um, and even ICU doctors is chest X-rays. So I just wanted to quick, quickly brief talk on um, on chest X-rays, just reading them. So the way that we read a chest X-ray. I'll just tell you guys, so it's A, B, C, D, E. And this is like a great mnemonic. Um, I'm a fellow, so I will always ask my residents, I'll be like, okay, can you read this chest x-ray for me? What do you see? So airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and then everything else. So airway. So when you're looking at the airway here, you look to see if this airway is open. And the way you see if it's open is if there's pretty much just air going through it, if you see it as black. But if you notice that there's something white or something stuck in the middle, or if there's a tube in there, then you're like, okay, well, this airway is um, is not normal. But this is this, and just for reference, is a normal chest X-ray. So yeah, you look at your airway, and then uh, you're you try to see if you can look at the crina, and this is the crina here, and the crina is where the main stem bronchi branch off, the right and the left kind of branch off. You can see here. So you you look to see is it straight? Is it um in the midline? Is it to one side? Is the heart pushing on it? Um, so that's airway. And then you look to see if there's a foreign body or if there's um, an endotracheal tube inside of it. So that's kind of, that's A. Then B is breathing. So you kind of, you count the number of ribs, if you can count them, 10 posteriorly. So, um, and then, and then anterior, you try to see if you can count and how many you can see if there's a lot of space between them. And then you also look to see if their lungs are well expanded. So from top to bottom, if you see anything that's um, causing it, causing the lungs to not expand like pleural effusion, if you see pleural effusion, then you are fluid in the lungs and you'll see, um, you'll see that the lungs won't be as expanded here, meaning uh, you'll just see haziness on the bottom areas. And then also things with breathing. Yes, yeah, so when you're counting the ribs, uh, you have to count from the back forward. So if you imagine this is like a rib cage. So this part is the anterior part, the part coming back because of the lucency of the picture, You, it's actually back. So here you're counting, this will be one. And this will have to be the posterior part. Here's the anterior. So you count, uh, you count the ribs and then you, you can look at the, you look here to see this hilum area. The hilum area is always by the right main, the, by the right main bronchi. So this is what we call the hilum of the lung. We try to see if that's maybe bigger than normal because that can indicate like sarcoid, that can indicate lung cancer because lymphadenopathy. And then also with breathing, we look at the diaphragm and the diaphragm is important because um, one side can sometimes be elevated. Um, maybe the diaphragm is, is both of them are high or both of them are low because it's like a hyperinflated person. Um, so diaphragm is something that we look in with breathing or you can put it in the D. But um, okay, then C would be like circulation. So this is when you're looking at the heart. So you look to see, um, does this take up two thirds of the whole, uh, if, if, this, if this takes up more than one third. So if this takes up two thirds, then they could have cardiomegaly, meaning the heart is big. Normally we expect to take up like one third where like it is right now that we see. We expect one third to like be on the right side here. So some of it will be on the right here and then some of it will be on the left side here. And this is important because if one side is bigger than the other, like let's say the right was bigger than the left, then you would say, think something like pulmonary hypertension. Um, and the cardiothoracic ratio we look at, and then sometimes, uh, the whole thing can be flipped in like um, in Cartagner syndrome, which is very rare, but um, you can see that. Then uh, disability for the D, which you can look at the ribs to see if there are any fractures. And if there are any obvious fractures, it will just be a line. I'm not, ra not radiology, but these are just our quick things that we look at. Um, 
And then you look to see the clavicles and you make sure that the clavicles are in line with each other. So they're both like this and they're in line. And this matters because if patients turn when they're taking the x-ray, then it will give you a different picture. So you try to make sure that they're both in line and symmetric. And this will tell you that the patient was upright and straight when they were shooting the picture. And that's important just for um, to make sure that it's an accurate film. And then E is kind of like everything else. So you look at like for, you can look at the fusions if there are, if there are any, and if there are, you wouldn't see this border and this angle so, um, so perfect that it would be like kind of blunted. You have like blunting of the angles. You just make, you can look at the, you can quickly look at the stomach here and see the gastric bubbles with the colon and just see if there's any air under the diaphragm. Air in the diaphragm is bad. You look to see if the long apices are clear. But yeah, so for my, if I was looking at this chest x-ray, first thing I would do, I'd be like, okay, well, let's make sure it's a good x-ray. Is it too white, too bright? Or like, it, does it look like it's just perfect? And this one looks like it's just perfect because it's not too loosened, not too bright with the lung field. And um, you see a good amount of aeration, but you also see a good amount of like lucency. Then I'll look at the, like we said, A, B, C, D, E. So A, airway, looks like I can see the trachea here. I can see a branching off. I don't see any obvious um, endotracheal tube or any obstruction here. Um, so it's like A and then B, breathing. I can count the ribs. It looks like um, there are 12 and 10. So this looks good here and here. Uh, and then I don't see any obvious blunting of the angles to make me think that there is an effusion. The heart looks like it's in a good spot, one third of the right, two thirds to the left. Um, it's not taking up too much of the hemithorax to make me think there's a cardiomegaly or heart failure. Uh, it doesn't look like this, the hilum is full to make me think that there's a pulmonary hypertension going on. I don't see the left side being um, extremely big as well. I don't notice any obvious rib fractures for the D disability. Diaphragm doesn't look like it's elevated for D diaphragm again. And so that's a quick, quick and dirty, easy chest x-ray thing to just kind of go, go for that we do when um, we're, when we're going into the ICU and just kind of looking over a patient's chest x-ray fast in clinic to see if um, this patient has pneumonia or like COPD or something. So now kind of getting into um, another quick case, we'll have to make this one quick, I think, because because of time, but um, this, well, this one's kind of highlighting another important part of uh, pulmonary critical care. This is more of a critical care case now. So here we have a 47 year old man. He runs a yard service and he cut his thumb while attaching an accessory to one of his mowers. Next morning, he noticed his thumb is very sore and the skin cut is red. He ignores it and heads out to work early evening. So he's working for like 12 hours. By the time he gets back home, thumb, the thumb is swollen and throbbing. There's pus coming out of it and there's red streaks going up his arm. Just as he thinks, he was thinking about getting some medical attention, his wife takes him to the ER. When he arrives to the ER, he has a temperature of 39.7, which is above 103. He's flushed, ill-appearing. Um, heart rate is 125, tachycardia, and blood pressure is 100 over 60. Normally, this guy is hypertensive and runs in the 140s. No other remarkable findings on um, physical exam. So key things to point out here, uh, he has he's febrile. He's tachypnic. Yeah, okay, I didn't put the respiratory rate, but um, yeah, so he's febrile, he's tachycardic, and he has um, a low blood pressure for him. And he also has chills and is becoming queasy. So prelim diagnosis. Um, this, uh, if, if you guys have heard of SERS criteria, this kind of suggests a pretty bad systemic inflammatory response syndrome. SIRS, SIRS, so fever, tachypnea, tachycardia, uh, suggests SIRS. In this case, there was obvious signs. He had pus, fever, recent wound infection. That kind of gives you the source itself. So diagnosis of sepsis, SIRS with a proven or uh, micro, micro, microbial etiology is justified. So yeah, you can say sepsis. Sepsis um, is what this, this patient has. Sepsis is something that we do deal with all the time in the ICU. That's kind of the bread and butter of the ICU. So he has obvious hypotension in addition to the standard sepsis SERS criteria. So he appears to have progressed to severe sepsis at this point. Severe, so there's, you have sepsis and severe sepsis and septic shock. Severe sepsis is sepsis plus hypotension or one or more signs of organ dysfunction. And then organ dysfunction, pretty much um, indicative, other things that would be indicative would be metabolic acidosis, meaning you have kidney failure and your bicarb is low, acute encephalopathy, if um, you have septic encephalopathy, oliguria, so you're once again, going back to the kidneys and AKI, 
not peeing as much. So your kidneys just stop working. You're trying to divert the blood flow from the kidneys to other places. Hypoxemia. So you're starting to go into respiratory failure or DIC disseminated um, intravascular coagulation. So your liver enzymes are stopping to work and you're not being able to clot appropriately. So your next steps, uh, this is a dangerous situation because it can progress to septic shock. And that is defined as sepsis with hypotension and organ dysfunction. So you need three criteria for septic shock. You need hypotension, sepsis, and organ dysfunction. And this can be fatal. So um, in this patient, in this patient, we performed, we did blood cultures. That's really important. We uh, started antibiotic. Antibiotic therapy is uh, life-saving in sepsis and septic shock, which we have all learned from um, the guidelines of surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. Antibiotic therapy is number one. Uh, and usually when patients first come in, we don't have a, or we don't know a clear source sometimes, or maybe we even do know, like in this guy, we know it was his hand, but we don't know what bacteria is growing. So because we don't know what bacteria is growing, we usually do gram positive and gram negative. The guy comes from the city. He's not like a hospital indweller or a frequent flyer where we'd have to cover for hospital acquired. So we're just going to go gram positive, gram negative, like vancomycin and cefepime or vancomycin and zosin. So we do blood cultures and this will tell us if there's a bacteremia or try to get down to the source um, of the infection. And then other things we would do CBC with differential. We would try to look for a left shift with the bandemia and look at the white count. Uh, basic metabolic panel to look at electrolytes and kidney function, or you can do a comprehensive metabolic panel, which would include liver enzymes. If you do a BMP, make sure you get a CMP as well. A lactate, a lactate is a cellular level hypoperfusion, meaning um, as you guys know, as pre meters when you're reading about the Krebs cycle, you're, you're forming glycolysis. So when um, you need energy for yourselves, it goes through the Krebs cycle and then you hope to get out glucose. But if it's anaerobic and there's, there's just not much, um, there won't be ATP being produced. Instead, it will be diverted to making lactate. So, um, and this happens in sepsis and severe septic shock. And this is because, uh, there's just not, there's just not much, um, aerobic glycolysis going on. Uh, then procalcitonin is something you can get. And this is a marker for bacterial infections uh, in response to antibiotics or just um, an inflammatory marker in, in a response to a bacterial infection. We trend the procal. We don't just get one. We get one and then we get it again to see if we should continue antibiotics or should we stop antibiotics. With COVID, we've been getting procals too, but we'll get into COVID in a little bit. Then um, we, in this guy specifically, we can do ID consult, general surgery consult, and we obtain imaging, like a CAT scan, chest x-ray, to rule out an abscess or necrotizing fasciitis, an abscess in his thumb with that, with that pus oozing, with like that pus oozing he had, and um, just being tachycardic and the chills he had. So yeah, so with some, this is a pretty straightforward case. If I was taking care of this patient, I would be like, okay, well, it looks like we have a source. Let's get source control. Um, and source control would mean if he needs a debridement or if, if it's an abscess and just an IND, an incision and drainage, uh, let's get source control with antibiotics, let's get blood cultures, let's make sure he doesn't progress to shock. Because if these patients do progress to shock, then we usually have to put a line in their neck. Um, and this, this would be called the central line. Uh, and it goes straight into the SVC, into the heart. And then these with these specific IV lines, they're bigger bore and they're three catheters. They, um, they're they used for va for uh, pressors, vasopressors, like um, norepinephrine or, do or dobutamine, dopamine, epinephrine, vasopressin. That's things that we run through central axis. You can't run those medications through a peripheral line because um, they, they will cause the infiltrations and ischemia to the digits. So this is uh, the diagnostic criteria from New England Journal of Medicine for what we were talking about, sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. This is important to kind of know. And like we said here, for severe sepsis, you need sepsis plus organ dysfunction. For septic shock, you need sepsis plus hypotension, uh, refractory to IV fluids, or hyperlactemia. And lactate is very important as well. All right, so now let's, we're going to get into our last case. I try to do two cases there, kind of showing the pulmonary aspect and the critical care aspect. Uh, sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock, all that is our bread and butter in um, the ICU. We are putting lines in people all the time, arterial lines, central lines. Um, we're intubating people. 
And this is for organ dysfunction secondary to likely sepsis or some type of shock here or there. All right, now case three. Uh, this is what's happening in the world today. So I'm sure everyone's interested about COVID-19. All right, we have a 21 year old female. She comes in with shortness of breath, fevers, body aches and sore throat. She has been partying about seven days ago and her friend tested positive for COVID-19. Next steps, diagnosis. Well, in this, in this uh, unfortunate 21 year old female who was partying uh, seven days ago, she likely has COVID. I mean, at this point, um, at this day and age, we would test her for COVID. That would be the next steps. We would test her and um, I mean, I guess it could be flu or it could be cold, but more than likely being exposed to somebody who you've been in contact with, close contact with, they had COVID, then you, you, there are high, there's a high chance that you will have it. So in this girl, the next steps would be we would test her, do the rapid test, the nasopharyngeal swab test. Uh, if she was negative, I would test her antibodies, IgG, to see if maybe she was exposed or um, yeah. And then we get blood tests. So, oops. Okay. So with the well, this is a normal picture of um, of lungs, like we were talking about. Here's your trachea, and then it breaks off into your right main stem, and then your left main stem. From here, it branches off into um, to your bronchi, and then your bronchioles, and each of these supply a different area of your lungs. So it's important to remember. Um, that this is a normal picture. And then the what's around it is the, um, the epithelium part that has type one and type two alveolar cells. And these produce surfactant and secretions. So this is your normal bronchi. And here are your bronchioles branching out into your alveolar sacs. And then your alveolar sacs have type one and type two alveolar cells, as you can see here, and they produce surfactant and they, they have, um, they secrete, just like they have the goblet cells that secrete mucus. So here is uh, what happens in a normal lung and then COVID-19 lung. So we said that there are lung surfactant, it's just a vicious cycle here. So you, all right, it's a cycle here. So you have the lung surfactant that's produced by your type two alveolar cells. And then when you get destruction of the type two alveolar cells, then you're going to get uh, activation of your tissue, tissue macrophages. Because if, if you get destruction of these alveolar cells that just aren't producing mucus, then, um, then your alveoli are just going to fill up and fill up with, uh, with the inflammation from not, if they can't secrete everything, then it's gonna fill up with it. So it has to be secreted and that will, um, that will activate these tissue macrophages and the tissue macrophages will kind of come in and be like, what's going on? So if they kind of, if they're there and then they say, well, what's going on? Then that, that will, that's not normal to the body when macrophages are around because macrophages as we know are destructors. So they'll come in, they'll destruct things. And that will then cause a cytokine release because our body will be like, well, why are these macrophages there? Let's release all these interleukins to try to fight this off. So then it kind of becomes like a vicious cycle. Um, and that's kind of what happens in COVID. So you have massive ma macrophage infiltration and alveolar macrophage activation. We said that these aren't normal for a long period of time. Our body will try to fight it off itself by, by cascading a cytokine storm. You'll get more destruction and then you'll get loss of your anti-inflammatory lung protective surfactant. And this is important because we said that uh, type two cells are what produce surfactant. So you get destruction of that. Um, and then when you get destruction of that, then it just, it fills up the alveoli within itself. So it fills up the alveoli within itself and then around it, the macrophages start eating it. And you just get loss of normal lung over time with COVID-19. And if you get loss of normal lung, you start to look like this. So if you remember that normal chest X-ray, this is normal. So keep this in mind. And I'll go back to that other one. But keep this in mind that this is normal. You see good aeration here, all black. You see the normal vessels. But once again, good aeration. 
then you get this. It's not normal aeration, severely diminished aeration. And this is just a CAT scan kind of of a, a coronal view. And you can see here, there's a lot of ground glass opacity, ground glass patchy opacities like all over scattered. Basically what this is, is kind of just um, ground glass opacity consolidation. And when this happens, all these portions of the lung are not participating in oxygenation and ventilation. And this is an issue because if you're losing this much lung that's not participating in oxygenation and ventilation, then you're not going to be able to breathe properly. Hence, dyspnea, the desaturations, and all the symptoms of um, the respiratory that COVID people um, have. All because of this cascade of a storm. Okay, so... Uh, a little bit more about COVID. So when somebody comes in with COVID, we order a ferritin, which is an inflammatory marker. This is always elevated. LDH, which is also, also um, highly elevated well as well. This is lactate dehydrogenase. Um, CPK, which is creatine phosphokinase, and this is muscle breakdown. So that's happened with COVID too. We look at the lymph, absolute lymphocyte count. This is um, low in patients with COVID. We look at the white count, uh, procalcitonin, and this procalcitonin can kind of help us see because sometimes there could be a superimposed bacterial infection or we think that maybe this is community acquired pneumonia instead of COVID. So procal can kind of sometimes help us tease that out. Then we get PT, PTT, INR. Those are coagulation panel just to make sure that this, that their lung, their liver functions okay. We get a D-dimer because a lot of these patients now, as we've found, have been getting um, a lot of thromboembolisms. So we're getting a lot of DVTs and pulmonary embolisms. So D-dimer kind of helps us if that's high, then they're um, likely to clot. And if they're likely to clot, we start them on anticoagulation early. Get a troponin. High troponins now have been associated with uh, worsened mortality, uh, with worsened mortality and, um, and heart failure. Then we get a BNP, brain natriuretic peptide, because this can tell us if um, if it goes very high, then maybe the patient's in heart failure. So it's good as like a baseline. Uh, then we get an echocardiogram of the heart to see if the heart is um, pumping okay because COVID attaches to ACE2 receptors and ACE2 receptors are not only found in the lungs, but they're also found in the heart. And the ACE2 receptor is how they get in. So everything that I was describing here is after they actually get into the lungs. But their attachment is through ACE2. Uh, then we get, yeah, echo ultrasound, same thing. Uh, CMP, comprehensive metabolic panel with the liver enzymes, because you can see elevated AST and elevated ALT. And this is important because some of the medications that we use like remdesivir, we, um, we if, if the AST and ALT are too high, we can't use remdesivir. And then we get glucoses because glucoses uh, have been very high in COVID. And plus we give them steroids. Steroids cause higher glucoses too. So COVID is systemic. It affects uh, not just the lungs. It affects the heart. Like we said, it can cause um, shock. It can cause uh, heart attacks. It can cause arrhythmias. It can cause Takotsubo. It cause myocarditis now. We learned the inflammation of the heart it can cause. Then thromboembolism, like we said, it can cause DVTs, pulmonary embolisms all over. Neuro, there's a lot of long-term effects that they're talking about, like the brain fog associated with COVID. It can cause dizziness, encephalopathy, Guillain-Barre. There have been six cases reported through New England Journal of Medicine. You get loss of smell. You can get strokes by the mechanism of the thromboembolism just going up the brain. A lot of kidney failure we've been seeing. Uh, you get hyperglycemia, the high glucose we were talking about in patients that are already diabetic. This puts them in DK. And there's a lot of different um, skin manifestations, petechiae, livid reticularis, urticaria, vesicles. Uh, and then GI, you can get like nausea, vomiting, and just diarrhea. So COVID is pretty systemic. Um, I didn't mention the respiratory ones on these because we just went into pretty detail about it here. Well, uh, pretty much with that being said, guys, I'm going to I am actually done. So I'm going to ask you guys if you have, actually, if you guys have any questions for me, you can put them in the chat now. Um, in my experience this year, I have seen a lot of COVID patients. Uh, March, April, and May were wild months. We took care of them here in Detroit. I'm at actually at Wayne State, um, Detroit. So we took care of a lot of COVID patients. Uh, we 
intubated them early because we thought that was the right thing to do then. Now we know that we hold off intubation. Um, these patients crashed. It was very sad to see them because they just weren't with their families and their families could not visit them. Uh, we tried everything we could back then. Now we're, we're just learning more things now every day. We learned something new. First, when we started, it was like no steroids. Then it was like steroids. Then we learned like hydroxychloroquine, then no hydroxychloroquine. So, I mean, it was, it's all been like a learning, crazy learning cascade. But um, unfortunately, it's starting to come back heavy. Uh, today alone, there was six that got admitted to our ICU here. So it's coming back. Uh, stay safe, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer all the time, wear a mask. The mask is very important. The mask definitely stops transmission, 100% stops transmission. Okay, questions. Let's see. How does the growing antibiotic resistant epidemic affect the treatment plan for respiratory diseases? It does because uh, you get colonized. As somebody who has COPD and you keep coming back for COPD exacerbation, we are going to give zithromycin, doxycycline, zithromycin, doxycycline. We're going to give a macrolide, maybe even leviquin. And then over time, they get used to that and they become colonized with something else. COPD years are highly colonized with pseudomonas now. We're learning if they have very, very, very low re respiratory reserve because their cilia doesn't work as much. Their mucociliary clearance is very diminished. So they can't exhale the bacteria. So with that, the growing antibiotic resistance does cause problems for us, um, for our patients. So we, we try to stay on top of this by getting sputum samples from them, especially if they're responding well to our treatment at first, and we'll get imaging to follow up. How often are you learning new information for diagnosing COVID? Oh, we're learning new information like every day. Um, yeah, it's constant. You'll hear something out in the news every every day, but um, guidelines, in terms of guidelines changing, that does take a little more time, I would say. Uh, we're trying to do like the best we can, but yeah, I mean, we learn things a lot. How does the growing end? Oh. For COPD with lung transplants, are patients with autoimmune disease to lupus with high COPD candidates for lung transplant? Does that eliminate them? They're, they could be a candidate. There's no reason that they cannot be a candidate. Uh, they, we just need a CAT scan to make sure that they don't have fibrosis. Even if they did have fibrosis, that wouldn't be a contraindication. It would just be based off their um, lung function reserve. So we need spirometry. If they're FEV1, because the question was autoimmune disease like lupus and severe COPD, are they candidates for lung transplants? So uh, yeah, you just need their PFTs and if they have very severe FEV1, very low, or their uh, their ratio, the FEV1 to FBC ratio is very low, or their DLCO is extremely low, then that would disqualify them. And the reason is because like we said, they would never come off the ventilator. They don't have that much reserve to, to stay on a vent. They'll become dependent on a vent. Uh, can you please go over your educational path to work in pulmonary critical care? Yeah, so, um, my, my training path that I did is, so I went to med school, I actually went to med school in the Caribbean. I would not say that going to med school in the Caribbean for me was any different than if I had gone to med school in the U S I highly encourage you guys to apply broadly, apply everywhere. Um, don't ever feel a stigma towards someplace that you went. I mean, I'm in pulmonary critical care and I went to the Caribbean. So, but, uh, yeah, so I went to Antigua, and then after Antigua, I did my rotations in Miami through the FIU program, and then I went to um, New York for my fourth year, and then for my first, for, the, for my pathway, I chose internal medicine because I knew I wanted to do a fellowship. I didn't just want to stop in internal medicine. I was like, I want to do internal medicine to do something else. So I did internal medicine for three years in um, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC, and then I started my fellowship in pulmonary critical care. So you can do, you do med school, internal medicine, and then pulmonary critical care. That would be the educational pathway. But earlier, like we were speaking about, you can just do critical care alone and you can just do pulmonary alone. Uh, advice for pre-med students. Uh, it's a long journey. It's, you guys are highly, highly needed. This is, everybody needs a doctor especially today. And with COVID coming around, who knows what's going to come next. So like 
it's so important to just have doctor, good doctors around. It's so needed. And I, I love what I do. I love pulmonary critical care. And I think with COVID, it raised a lot of eyes to kind of look over at pulmonary critical care doctors and be like, wow, you guys are in there just doing all these procedures on COVID people because uh, we don't have a choice. So we were intubating them, we're putting in lines in them. We we're like, you know, trying our best to save their life essentially. Uh, we had a pretty bad COVID patient recently, like last week, um, came in extremely short of breath, had to be intubated right away. So they got intubated, they were placed on the vent and um, pair. So what we do is we intubate them and then we place them on the vent and then we will paralyze, we will put them, we will knock out their respiratory drive. So if somebody, if you intubate somebody, they're still somewhat breathing on their own. They can trigger the machine on their own. So we take away their drive of breathing because their lungs are so bad and their lungs need to rest. Their lungs need to rest. So the way we do this is we will essentially paralyze them is what you call it through medication. And then we prone them. So we switch the, we move when you, someone sleeps, they sleep on their back, we'll put them on their front. So put them on their stomach. And this is what we call proning and proning will divert blood flow within the lungs itself to other areas on the ventral or the front surface. Um, also the oxygenation will change. So you will, you won't be on your back as much, but you'll be on your stomach. So you can open up the lower lobe areas and the, the back parts of the lungs to oxygenation. Um, so that's what we call proning. And that's been proven in acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. So even patients that do have COVID and they're not intubated, they're not hospitalized even, we tell them to self-prone and this helps with their oxygenation. Uh, yeah, so we had a bad patient that came in. We just tube intubated them right away. And then we paralyzed them, we proned them. And even that wasn't doing anything for them. So then we had to do, we had to put them on ECMO. ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And it's basically a bypass for their lungs and their heart. So it's essentially lungs and heart outside their body. It's completely giving rest for their lungs and their heart to kind of recover with itself. And um, there's a machine that's doing the work of the lungs and heart by circulating the blood and by breathing for them, taking the bad blood, essentially what do the lungs do? The lungs take the bad blood and give it oxygen and then give it back to the pulmonary artery. So it takes it from the pulmonary veins, gives oxygen and then spits it out through the pulmonary artery to the left side of the heart. That's what this machine does, ECMO. Uh, what made you choose attending a Caribbean med school? That's a great question. Um, so I was taking the MCAT, the infamous MCATs and uh, I took it and then like, I didn't do as well as I wanted to. And I was just hearing of, of all these people who are going to Caribbean med schools. And it seemed like it was an easier, not an easier path, I guess, but it would seem like at the time, uh, an island and the pathway just seemed easier, I guess, to get into than a US med school. I mean, yeah, it just did with my GPA at that time and um, my MCAT scores, I was just like, well, oof, okay. Um, I can wait around, I, I can wait, which wasn't an issue too, but I just love medicine. I always knew that this is what I wanted to do. So I'm like, I'm gonna get there one way or the other. So <laughs> I, I wouldn't like uh, disparage against it at all. Like I would definitely say that it's equal opportunity. Uh, even my fellow colleagues who went to an American school compare and like I, I myself, I have um, med students with me today. I had three Wayne state uh, medical students with me and they're, they're awesome. They're so they're like just great. And then the other day I had a couple of Caribbean med students with me who like rotate with me in the pulmonary clinic. Um, and so like, it's really what you make it med school. But um. Yeah, any other questions that you guys can think of? Otherwise, I'm gonna leave this here. Thank you all for attending. I have my email address on here. It just means 1216 at gmail.com. And then my Instagram is meansy. And then my website is meansmd.com. Um, on my Instagram, sometimes I'll put like uh, stories of what I see slash what I do. If you would like to learn more about pulmonary critical care, my email address is always open to anybody that um, has any questions uh, about the process, what I went through, any other questions you could think about with pulmonary critical care. Definitely feel free to email me. 
Instagram-y website. Just don't page me. <laughs> but um, yeah, so pretty much just like feel free to reach out to me. I'm pretty friendly. And if you guys don't have any other questions, I think that's about it. Thank you so, so much, Dr. C. This was such an amazing presentation. It was so informative and detailed. Thank you for taking the time to answer some of our questions as well. As Dr. C said, everyone make sure you check her out on her socials. Additionally, thank you everyone for attending. The link to the Google form has been posted in the comment section. Um, so please fill that out in the next 30 minutes. So you'll have until 7, 10, 7, 11 ish. So we can receive verification of your attendance. And thank you so much again, Dr. C. Of course, thank you for having me.